Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, You're a New Leader. Now what? This training is brought to you by Commercial Electronics. If you'd like to learn more about our recording solution and third-party quality assurance services, visit comelectronics.com. This webinar is part of our public safety education series, and you can view our upcoming webinars on our training page at comelectronics.com slash training. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. If you're listening in using your computer's speaker system, you're automatically muted to eliminate background noise. If you'd prefer to join over the phone, just select the handset in the audio pane at the bottom right, and the dial-in information will be displayed. You can submit questions about today's lesson at any time by typing your questions into the Q&A pane of the control panel, and I'll address those during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Now, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. For those of you wanting to report this training to your state certification or licensing agency, send an email to training at comelectronics.com. My name is Beth English, and I'm your instructor today. I began my 911 career as a police dispatcher 33 years ago when I was nine, and most recently served as a communications director before joining Commercial Electronics as the program manager for their QAQI program and higher ground instructor. I have my master's telecommunicator license from Texas. I'm a TCOL instructor and a past president of Texas NENA. So let's get started with our session. At the end of today's session, you should be able to list the steps for establishing yourself as a leader and list the things that you want to avoid doing as a new leader. But before we get started, I want to take a poll. I want to know what experience you have as a leader. You have zero to one year, one to five, five to 20, or 10 plus. Sorry, y'all, that was a typo. Okay, so most of you have quite a bit of experience as a leader. Well, this is going to be interesting then um, because it's going to be interesting to see how much of uh, some of these things that we talk about um, you will actually have experienced yourself. Okay, so congratulations. You have the skills, you proved yourself, and you got that job. You're stoked about it, and you've already decided how you're going to spend that big raise you got, or you've already spent that big raise you got. By the third day, you're probably thinking to yourself, what have I done? Your friend, who also had Tuesdays off and used to go antique shopping with you, now won't look at you. One of the midnight crew members came in sick and calls you 15 minutes later because he's too sick to work, which means you're going to have to direct someone from days to cover his shift, and she has three children to drop off at school in the morning. Someone on days was 10 minutes late getting back from lunch, so now everyone is behind and you're going to be late for your meeting. You're expected to have a report to the chief in the morning, but you won't have time to work on it now. But that doesn't really matter because you don't even know where to get the information from, much less how to create the chart that he's requesting. Yep, congratulations to you. Okay, let's do another quick poll. And I want to know what you've experienced from your employees since becoming a leader. And you, you can pick, I believe, more than one on this one. Whether you've had jealousy from your employees, you've had employees who thought you were too green, you were, people thought you were too young. Okay? Interesting mix. 
Let me show these results. Okay. Very interesting. All right. So being a new leader is never easy, whether you were promoted from within or you were recruited from outside the agency. Each situation has its own challenges, regardless of which leadership role you're in now, whether you're a supervisor, a manager, or a director. Um, to keep it simple, I'm just going to use the term supervisor. Now, if you grew up in your agency and were promoted to a supervisor and you're going to have you're going to have a whole set of challenges that are going to be unique to that situation. I'm sure you've heard it before, and you were probably told this again when you were offered the position, but there will be a big change in the relationship between you and your previous coworkers. Uh, in fact, if you've been in your position for more than a couple of days, you've probably already faced some of those challenges, and it looks like you, um, a lot of you have from the poll results. But if not, let's talk about what you can expect. So being promoted um, within the agency will almost always cause jealousy in some. You may supervise employees who were once supervisors themselves, but stepped down for better hours or days off. Uh, or maybe they were a supervisor at another agency and they think they know more than you. So because of this, they will test you to see if you really know what you're doing. Many times they will ask you basic questions to the point of sounding ignorant, just to see if they can throw you off. You may also have um, employees who have issues with your experience. Um, most often that's going to be someone who's been with the agency longer than you have and who thinks you don't have enough experience to be a supervisor. They may not or they may or may not have applied for the position themselves, but regardless, they still think that you're too green to have it. And so they're going to challenge challenge you every chance they get and try to prove that you haven't been there long enough to be a supervisor. Um, another issue that may come up is uh, age. In some cases, there will be employees who don't want to work for someone younger than they are. It's basically a blow to their ego. To them, your authority doesn't seem legitimate. And because we've all stereotyped people from different generations, um, the age difference may cause some misunderstandings and frustration on both sides. You know, younger people look at boomers as dinosaurs who refuse to retire. And this may be how you see those old timers yourself. Uh, boomers, you know, we tend to look at younger people as being surgically attached to their cell phones. And so this may be how the old timers view you. Um, if you transferred from outside, um, you will have different challenges. Employees may think you were brought in to replace them. They, they may feel that they have no future in the organization, um, especially if they applied for the job themselves. They can be angry, hurt, and rejected because you aren't familiar with their processes and procedures, and they're going to have to train you, someone who makes more money than they do. Now, some employees will be afraid to talk to you, while um, others will be eager to give you all the scoop on previous management. So um, other employees, they want to give you the scoop on, on other employees, the department, anything else that they feel you need to know. And so basically what they're wanting to do is get to you before anyone else does so that they can form your opinion. And you may also be considered the outsider in more ways than one. If you came from a different city, county, or even state, employees may feel that you just don't know their ways. And even if you came from somewhere geographically close, employees will still have that feeling that you're an outsider. 
So does any of this sound familiar familiar to, to any of you? Well, what you're going to have to do is establish yourself. And the first thing to do is realize that your status in the agency has changed. Your coworkers that left that you left after your last shift are no longer your peers. You're the supervisor now, and your interactions with them are going to change in several ways. One of the biggest mistakes that we make as a new supervisor is trying to be liked. We all want to be liked. And this is especially true if you were promoted from within. As hard as it is to admit, your friends aren't your friends anymore. Now, that doesn't mean you're mortal enemies or that you have to go around cracking the whip at everyone, but it does mean that your confidence will have to change. You will not be able to go home at night and call your shift mate to complain about the way someone handled a call or the fact that someone was late again or that it's time to do your certification training uh, for that stupid new system that the agency purchased. The friends that you used to gossip with before um, we'll try to get you to spill the beans about things going on in the center or about personnel issues that they're hearing rumors about. And you can't do any of that. You can't gossip about coworkers or employees. Um, you may hear things um, from other conversations, but you need to stay out of them. If someone starts talking about a coworker's personal business, or saying something critical about the agency, you need to redirect that conversation. If something is told to you in confidence by an employee, you have to keep it private. Unless there's a legal obligation to reveal it, you cannot tell it to anybody else. Um, you're going to be expected to keep things confidential, um, even though you're dying to tell someone. And trust me, you will come across some situations that will make you feel as if you will just explode if you can't talk with someone about it. Um, one new supervisor shared a negative comment with an employee who she considered to be a friend, and that friend shared the comment with the employee who was the subject of the comment. So the next day, the employee confronted the supervisor in front of everyone on the shift. And the supervisor was completely blindsided. So you don't want to be blindsided because of a comment you made in confidence to the wrong person. So the only thing to do is to not say anything. This includes using text and instant messaging. So let's do another quick poll. Have you ever sent a disparaging text or message to the wrong person? Okay, at the moment it's about half and half. It's easy to do. Okay. So, one longtime supervisor was having a particularly trying day with a difficult employee. And she sent a message through the CAD system to her assistant supervisor venting about the struggles she was having. But because she was thinking about the employee, that's whose name she entered into the to field. When she realized her mistake, it was already too late. The employee had already read the text describing what a pain in the nether regions she was being. So again, be careful what you say. You can still be friendly with your previous coworkers. You just can't be friends. Now, there are other ways that you'll need to establish yourself as a supervisor in the agency. So let's talk about those. Okay, um, you're going to have to communicate. So to get started, you're going to have to work on gaining your employee's res 
respect. And you're going to have to establish trust, and you're going to have to demonstrate integrity. Now, even though they may have seen these qualities in you as their coworker, um, you need to show these qualities now in your new role as a supervisor. In our last session, uh, the top six leadership skills you need, I mentioned communication as being one of the soft skills that you need in order to be an effective supervisor. So this is going to be your opportunity to facilitate open and effective communication with your team. So you want to start by meeting with your new employees as a group. If you have uh, part-time employees or officers who are trained to work in communications, schedule them. Otherwise, meet with each shift. Determine with them if they want to meet before or after their shift and schedule it. You want to make the initial meeting mandatory, um, not to display your new power, but because you know what happens if a meeting is optional and you want everyone to hear the same thing from you, not what someone else heard through their filters. You want to let them know what your expectations are. As you know, every supervisor is different, and they need to know what you expect from them as well as what they can expect from you. Once you've told them what your, your expectations are, let them do their jobs. You've got adults working for you, for the most part, so treat them like adults. If you have an issue with someone, address that issue with that person, not the group. There's nothing worse than creating a blanket policy because one person did something wrong. Um, doing that may solve that particular problem, but it's going to create resentment amongst the rest of the employees, which will end up being a bigger problem. You want to acknowledge to your employees that their views are important. You want to ask them for their input and then listen to that input. You want to reflect back to them what you're hearing from them so that you're all on the same page. Find out what they think that you can do to make the agency better and what they think is actually right with the agency. And then once you've done that, make sure you continue to communicate to them how things are going and what you're doing on their behalf to make things better. You'll also want to meet with everyone one-on-one -on -one so you can get to know them and they can get to know you. Um, being raised in the agency, growing up in the agency, doesn't mean you automatically know everything about everyone, especially those that are considered to be challenging employees, because you know the ones that are challenging employees we generally tend to stay away from. So you may find that, um, that someone who's considered a challenge has some kind of situation in their personal life that makes them hard to deal with at work. Um, I had one previous employee who was particularly aggressive at work, and she had a daughter who had been shaken by the father, which caused major brain damage. As a result, the child needed 24-hour care. Okay, I think the webinar may have gone away, but hopefully it's back. Okay, um, anyway, the daughter had been shaken by her father, um, causing severe brain damage, and so she had to be cared for on a 24-hour basis. And the employee was angry at the world for the condition of her daughter and felt like, no one cared what she was going through. Um, meeting with her and getting to understand her situation made it easier to deal with her. Now, if you were brought in from the outside, the need to get to know your employees and for them to get to know you is even greater. One thing you don't want to do is start your new position by letting old baggage dictate how you interact with your employees. You know, they're going to have issues with previous management, um, with previous coworkers, 
um, with different people. And um, you don't want to let this old baggage dictate how you interact with them. Um, because the things that you do are going to be filtered through these issues that they've had with previous management or um, previous supervisors. And so um, you want to make sure that that they know you and they know what your expectations are. Um, in one of my jobs, I actually replaced a very challenging supervisor, also named Beth. So I started out with three marks against me just because of that. Um, you talk about having issues to overcome. So to avoid that, you want to start fresh with everyone from ground zero, so to speak. Now, in one agency that I worked for, during my oral interview, I was inundated with tales of this one employee. When I met her in person, she asked me one question. How thick is your skin? And then she left the room. Now, I will tell you, that scared me to death. I was interviewing for a new job, and that's the reaction I got. Um, I wanted to ask her what she meant, but she, but she just disappeared. So once I was hired, I had a meeting with everyone, and I told um, them that we were starting with a blank slate, that nothing that had happened in the past was being taken into consideration, and I was fine with everyone until or unless someone did something to me. About a week later, um, she came to me wanting to be a trainer again. She told me that she had, um, she had been a trainer, but she had made the previous director angry, and, um, and he removed her from the training program. But she did not feel that she had actually done anything wrong um, that warranted being removed from the program, and she still wanted to train. So I told her, just like I had in the meeting, we're starting fresh, and I told her I would let her train, and if we had problems, then we would address the problems at that time. She ended up being one of the best employees I had. I don't know if she changed or if she just performed better because we started fresh, but I never had a minute's problem with her, and I really hated it when she retired. I think a large part of her reputation and attitude had to do more with the gossiping and the trash talk from her previous director than anything else. And I believe that once she felt that her experience and her views were important, she became a model employee. So the point is not to let others past expectations and experiences create your relationship with your employees. You also want to let your employees know that you're open to listening to them on an ongoing basis. They need to know that they can talk to you and they can bring issues to your attention without fear of retribution. Now, you may have faced retribution for speaking up in the past, and if so, you know how that feels and you want to avoid doing that to anyone else. Um, your employees need to know that you're not going to do that to them and that your goal as a leader is to make things better for them if you can. You also want to stay visible to your employees. It's so easy to get busy with tasks and paperwork and meetings that you find yourself either in your office, in someone else's office, and having very little interaction with your employees. So your team wants to know that you're there for them and you can be counted on. And one way that you can demonstrate that is by staying visible. Now, health experts recommend getting up and walking at least once every hour. So use that opportunity to get out and check on your people. And don't forget the night shifts. Um, you may want to adjust your hours so that you can stay later or go in earlier to visit with them. Okay. You need to learn everything you can. As a new supervisor, the first thing you may want to do is jump in there and make all these big changes to the things that you thought were wrong in your agency. You're going to have to resist that temptation. 
since you were the one who was given the position, you obviously have the technical skills for the job. But now it's time to learn new skills. You want to seek out everything you can for management tools, resources, and classes you can take to help you. Um, APCO and Nina both have several management courses you can take. And if your agency doesn't have a training budget that would allow you to take those classes, look online for free classes. Also, check with your state APCO and NENA chapters to see if they have any scholarships that would help you attend some leadership courses. You can also apply for the RPL and the NP, e and p scholarships through the APCO and NENA uh, national organizations. You want to read your city, county, and agency SOPs and HR manuals. You're going to need to be able to link incidents or behavior violations to policies and SOPs probably much sooner than you think, if you haven't already. So you want to learn the processes for handling disciplinary actions. Um, let's do another quick poll. Here we go. Have you ever had an attitude about your boss until you found out the rest of the story? A big percentage, and that is so easy to do. I think we've all, really, most of us, if, if, you're, if you truly, truly think about it, you've probably done it. Okay, so let's talk about that. One of the things that most employees don't understand is why supervisors take some of the actions that they do. And usually it's because they are acting in a management capacity. They're following rules, regulations, and or orders from above that aren't common knowledge among the employees. Now, before you became a supervisor, you probably saw and heard things from your supervisors that you either thought were great or you thought to yourself, I'm never going to be like that or I would never do that to my employees. It's just like when you were a kid. You think, you know, you look at your parents and say, I am never going to be like that to my kids. Yeah. Well, how many of you are hearing your mother's voice come out of your mouth now? Same thing now. You're the supervisor, and you're going to be the one acting in a management capacity, doing things that are going to make some employees unhappy. For instance, I had an employee whose aunt had died, and she requested bereavement leave for four hours the night of the funeral, so she could drive her mother to the funeral. Now, the funeral was in the morning, but because she worked midnight, she wanted to use the bereavement leave to sleep uh, for a few hours before she came to work, which, of course, I approved. Well, that night, I went to a party at an officer that an officer's wife was having, and there was the employee. Now, I didn't say anything then, but when I was approving payroll, I noticed she had still put in for the bereavement leave. Now, because she had been at the party, obviously she wasn't using the bereavement leave for sleeping, so I had her change her half of the time to vacation or comp. I, I gave her the benefit of the doubt that she was home sleeping up until the minute before she came to that party. So I had her change two hours of it to vacation or comp. And she told me and everyone else who would listen um, that I was being petty. Now, many of the employees wondered why I had done that to her, and a couple of them were angry with me because of it. But they were under the assumption that I just did it to be mean because I didn't like her. She didn't tell them that she lied about needing to sleep and instead went to a party. And even though it does seem petty at first glance, at the time, all time off was being monitored very carefully because we were so shorthanded. And I think everybody understands being very shorthanded. We had used all of our overtime budget for the year, and we were still in the first quarter. In addition to that, I already had somebody working overtime that night to cover the shift, so I had to actually direct a second person to work overtime, which meant we were paying double overtime. And the chief was already counseling me in a very loud voice regularly 
for using so much overtime money. So you can see that um, oftentimes there are things going on in the background that you may not have been aware of. And so this is one reason that jumping in and deciding to make big changes is not the first thing that you want to do. Um, let me ask you another question. Have you ever had issues with change in your agency because they've always done it that way? Okay, that seems to be a big issue um, with agencies. And it was a huge issue that I had, um, actually at a couple of agencies that I've worked for. Um, we had always done it this way and it always worked this way, so there's no, no point in changing it. So, um, so that's another thing. Um, you don't want to develop a fear of making changes because everybody says we've always done it this way and it works. Um, and then you can develop a fear of making changes whether you are promoted from within or whether you're new to the ag agency. So if your employees have subscribed to that thought, we've always done it this way, and you're afraid of going against that, then your agency can never move forward. So what you want to do is engage your team members to find out what they think can be done better or differently and then support their ideas. Something else you want to look at is your budget. Find out what your budget looks like and where you are in that budget cycle. There may be things that your team has asked for that you need to plan for in future budgets. Uh, you may also want to budget for ways to recognize your team in the future. So definitely check into your budget, one of the first things. And although we, we discuss starting with a clean slate with everyone, you still want to do that. But at some point later, once you've established your relationship with them, you need to learn what you can about your employees. You want to review their personnel files, their personal history statements, and their past performance reviews. Now, you don't want to do this when you first promote because it will color your view rather than giving you a chance to establish that relationship that you want. So this would be something that you might wait a few months to do. And by then, you'll be able to absorb that information without creating biases that you don't need. And then be willing to admit, whether publicly or privately, that you don't know everything and create a plan to develop in the areas in which you are weak. Okay, get you a mentor. Now, because many of the situations you will face as a supervisor aren't outlined in any manual, getting a mentor will provide you with access to something you don't have access to, and that's experience. So many have been, uh, who have been in the business for several years um, will have encountered any situation you will face. And we're going to discuss some of these in one of our upcoming webinars um, about the situations that are not written in the manual. How do you handle those situations? Um, one thing is having a mentor will give you um, someone who will keep your confidences and discuss these issues with you. So you can check with your city uh, or county HR and see if they have a mentoring process set up. Uh, another consideration is uh, Nina has a formal mentoring program that you can access at this website um, at nina.org. Um, and you can also check out the Women in 911 Alliance, or WIN, um, at this second website that's on the page here. And then there's a Facebook group uh, called 91 Wonder Women. I got that right, 9 -1 Wonder Women. Um, so you can check out that Facebook group, and um, they have discussions there about different things uh, that they've encountered. So those are going to be some good resources for you as far as uh, getting a mentor. Now, when your 
searching for a mentor, a couple of things to, to think about. Um, having someone in the private sector can be um, advantageous because they may not be dealing with the same segment of society and therefore they may not have the attitudes and the biases that you're going to find in public safety. On the other hand, um, you're going to encounter issues in public safety that are not going to come up in your typical nine to five job. Um, and so having a mentor in another communication center may provide you with more insight to the attitudes of your employee. Um, you will just need to decide which one is best for you. Oops, so sorry about that. All right. Now that you've um, established your expectations and you're learning everything you can, you want to step back and look at the big picture, okay? Meet with your boss and see what their expectations are of you. Find out what goals they have and how your division or department fits into those goals. You know, up until now, your your skills and your performance were all that you needed to be successful, but that's no longer. You've moved from being essential. Yeah, sorry about that, but you're no longer essential. Um, you have taken a back seat to your team now because it's all about the team. Now, as a supervisor, you're going to need to focus on your group's performance to um, make sure that they're contributing to the success of your agency. For instance, if your agency has a goal of a five minute or less response time, are you providing everything your employees need to get the calls dispatched in time for the agency to meet those goals? This may include providing equipment, uh, providing training, and sometimes just giving them encouragement. And when your team succeeds, you need to share those results. Let them know how they're performing and take pride in their individual and their team performances. And let others in your city or your county know how your team is succeeding. Don't keep that to yourself. Share it with them. Share it with everyone. You know we need to get the word out about our successes. Okay, this sounds like a complete contradiction from what I said earlier, but it's not. Knowing your staff is different from being a buddy with your staff. Employees have enough buddies, but they need and they want a leader who's going to stand up for them, who will be honest and fair, and who will provide them with what they need to do their job. So technically, you are an outsider, and that's a good thing. Your employees need to be able to view you as a leader, one that they can trust. You're now in a perceived position of power, and you control everything from their schedules to their pay. So when your previous coworkers meet for lunch on their days off or um, they get together at the, you know, the local honky-tonk on the weekend, and they don't invite you, don't take it personally. It just means you're the leader. And then you want to groom them for growth. I grew up in an agency in which the school of thought was that the more knowledge you had, the more power you had. We were trained to do our jobs, but we weren't told the particulars of portions of the job. For instance, we knew that if a 911 call was misdirected, we had to fill out the alley discrepancy form. But we didn't know what Allie was. And then one day, three people retired and or quit at the same time. And the department was left with no one who knew anything about CAD, 911, the radio, or any of the other technology we used. We literally had to start from scratch trying to learn everything at once. One of your responsibilities as a supervisor is grooming your employees for growth and succession and preparing someone to be able to take your place should something happen to you. You need to teach them how 911 works, the different technologies used in 911, industry terms, and what to expect in the future of your agency. 
Now, I'm not saying you have to do this on day one. Um, more than likely, you're going to be learning much of this yourself. But you can share what you learn along the way. One way you could do this is by um, passing along things that you've learned during regularly scheduled shift meetings. Um, the added knowledge that you give your team um, is going to make them more successful. And the more successful they are, the more successful you are. Another way to groom uh, your employees for success is to offer different opportunities for them to do more than take calls or dispatch. You want to encourage them. Uh, encourage them to be volunteers for APCO or NENA committees. This lets them meet new people, make connections, and learn how standards are developed for communication centers. Um, have them do public education sessions at schools. Um, civic groups and neighborhood watch meetings. There are so many of us that get into 911 and then we act like the door is locked from the outside of the center. You need to unlock that door and get your employees involved. Now granted, there are going to be some that take full advantage of the opportunities and put great effort into learning more. But keep in mind, there are always going to be those employees who don't want to do anything extra. They want to sit at their position, take calls, dispatch units, and go home. You couldn't get them to do anything different if you put a bomb under their chair. And as aggravating as that may be to you, it's okay. Not everyone is going to want to have a career. They just want a job. Besides, everyone needs those worker bees. Now, as a supervisor, you're going to be busier than you've ever been. You're going to have multiple meetings, uh, sometimes meetings just to decide when you can next meet. Um, you'll re be responsible for reports, evaluations, equipment, hiring, disciplinary action. The list goes on, and you'll find that you can't keep up with it all. This is when you're going to learn the value of delegation, and that is a significant milestone in a good supervisor. So you may think it would be easier to do something that would take you an hour to do, as opposed to taking three hours to teach someone to do it. But that's not a reason to do it yourself. You can invest a little bit of time into training your employees to do some non-supervisory tasks and save yourself a lot of time in the long run. Um, after you've met with your employees individually and you've learned their strengths and weaknesses, you can delegate project-related tasks or administrative tasks to them that they're better suited for. Uh, maybe somebody's more detail-oriented than, than you are, um, and they'd be better suited to this report. So train them to do that. Besides, you can only stay late for so many weeks before you run yourself down. And staying late every day also gives your boss the impression that you don't have any time management skills. Now, um, I promise, last poll. Have you ever lost it in front of your employees? Okay, it's easy to do. So we're pretty close to half and half. And I, I will tell you all now, um, all of these things that I've learned about being a leader um, most of it I've learned the hard way. Some of it I've learned from watching other people learn the hard way. So, all right. You want to present model behavior. I know, I know. This is easier said than done. And it's even easier to do when you first get the job. However, as you get more comfortable in your position and with your employees, it's easier to let things slide and kind of let your humanness show. And every so often, you're going to have to do a status check to see where you are in your behavior. Your employees are going to look to you as a role model, so you need to be on your A game. This means keeping your word, keeping your personal opinions under wraps, and doing your best to represent your department or agency. And I can honestly say that I have not always succeeded at this. 
there have been times working in a good old boy network that I've lost it in front of my employees. Um, I've, I've been so angry a couple of times that I actually cried, not because my feelings were hurt, but because it was illegal to do what I wanted to do to the good old boys. At those times, I had to step back, regroup, and plot my next course of action, whatever that was going to be. And it's going to happen to each of you. The stress of the job, uh, budget cuts, personnel issues, and having bosses making decisions about your center who know nothing about communication will eventually get to you. And unless you're superhuman, you will act less than professionally at one time or another. And all you can do is dust yourself off and start again. Many moons ago, I was a supervisor in a communication center. And because of the way the schedule worked, I was off on Thursdays and Fridays for years. I longed for the day when I would be able to have weekends off, which I figured would be when or if three people died or retired at the same time, and I really didn't care which. Imagine my surprise when that's actually what happened. No one, well, yeah, no one died, but three senior people did leave at the same time, and that bumped me up to a daytime job with weekends off. Hallelujah. Then a hurricane happened. I had kept my headset, so I grabbed it, and I commenced to answering the phones and relieving radio operators. And then later, as a director, I continued to answer phones and radio traffic because I felt like I couldn't adequately address problems in the center if I didn't know what they were firsthand. Now, we talk about, you know, making sure that people can come to you and talk to you, and sometimes you can tell them that till the cows come home, but people are not going to tell you when things are broken or not working. So you need to be able to know that things are not working right. One way to do that is to be willing to jump in the trenches with your employees. You don't want to make it an everyday thing because they'll come to depend on you filling those spots and they'll soon take advantage of your goodness. Plus, they need to understand that they're responsible for their performance and your agency meeting its goals. But you need to be able to do it if, if it's needed. Not only will it be um, help for them at a stressful time, but it'll also go a long way towards garnering that respect that you want from them. Uh, many supervisors um, have destroyed their, uh, any respect that their employees had them uh, by saying, I don't get paid by the hour, but you do, so I'm not coming in. If you expect them to give up their days off for the agency, you have to be willing to do the same. Now, if you had to, could you grab a headset and jump in the trenches with them? If not, you might want to check that because that's something you need to be able to do. Things happen. When you're in a 24-7, 365 environment, there is no way to keep things from happening. You've got equipment from dozens of different vendors. 911 can go down, alley goes down, or you lose electricity. And those are the easy things to fix. You call the right people who wave their magic wands and suddenly everything works again. But what if it's something you did or didn't do that caused the problems you encountered? Or you get a complaint from one of your responder agencies. Your first impulse is to get defensive and find blame. Now, it would be very easy to blame the phone company, the CAD company, the recorder vendor, or the patrol officer. You want to blame anyone and everyone to keep whatever happened from reflecting badly on you or your employees, but that doesn't fix the problem. So as a supervisor, you have to set an example of doing whatever you need to do to take control and remedy the situation. Your employees are going to be watching to see how you handle it. So fix it, then figure out what went wrong with whom and hash it out afterwards with the involved party. So far, we've talked about things you will need to do as a new supervisor, but what about the things you want to avoid? 
By now, you've probably had that one supervisor who should never have been put in charge, and you have a list of reasons why. Not everyone is going to be a great supervisor. So if you don't want to be in that group, here are some things you want to avoid. Forget to say hello. Not everyone is a morning person, myself included. If you know me, you know how I am in the morning. But seriously, how hard is it to say hello to your employees? Don't act like it's physically impossible. Take a moment to greet your employees at the beginning of their shift. You should have been taught how to do this in kindergarten, but if you need help, you can find the closest five-year-old and consult with them. Criticize every effort. As a supervisor, you're going to delegate tasks and projects to your team as part of helping them grow in the agency. Now, they're going to put forth the effort, and they're going to bring you their results, almost like a child bringing a drawing to a parent. You may need to make some adjustments or corrections, but you want to be careful about criticizing every effort. Nothing can kill enthusiasm like criticism. You may have heard me mention before that I had a supervisor who would have me write letters or articles for various reasons, and then she'd always have me bring them to her to check. Her writing style and mine were quite different, and by the time she finished, quote unquote, correcting my work, it didn't remotely resemble what I had written. And after a while, I just quit trying so hard because I knew it wasn't going to be good enough for her. Don't do this to your employees. Remember, not everyone does the work the same way, but as long as the same result is achieved, it doesn't necessarily matter how they got there. All right. Um, it's hard to be happy all the time. And there are days we definitely don't want to go to work, but bringing a bad attitude to work affects everyone. If you have a bad attitude, you can't really expect your employees to have a good attitude. When I first started my career in 911, when I was nine, I had a supervisor who came to work every morning with the absolute worst scowl on her face. Now, I'm not a morning person, but even I didn't look like that at 6.30 in the morning. Her attitude scared everyone and made it difficult to get people to sign up for that shift because no one wanted to work with her. If you want your employees to come to work happy, you need to do the same. At least do a good job of pretending you're happy. We all know that we click with some people more than others. If you're a happy, friendly person, you may get along better with people who are more outgoing and gregarious. If you're more reserved, then you may get along better with those who are quiet and steady. It's just a natural response, but it's one that you need to avoid. Um, it's easy to halo someone or see them with a halo because you have similar personalities, but doing this will cause you to lose the respect of your employees that you have worked so hard for. So remain neutral, especially when it comes to disciplinary actions. Watch employees through social media. If you're friends with your employees on social media, you might want to rethink that. Stories abound about people losing their jobs because of posts their bosses saw on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And sadly, people don't think about who's going to be reading their pages until they post something they shouldn't have and get called on it. I could spend a week telling you about the posts I've seen from people who just didn't think. But the point is that you don't want to be the one spending all your free time policing what your people are posting. Not only that, but do you really want your employees reading your posts and knowing that you watch cheesy love stories in your pajamas all weekend? Just avoid the whole thing and don't follow or friend your employees. Allow an employee to drown. I once had a supervisor who left me alone on the main dispatch radio after training, training me for a week. It was shift change. There was a horrible storm going on, and we had major accidents everywhere. It took about 14 seconds for me to sink hard. 
When I got relieved on the radio, she took me to the lounge and commenced to chew me out, telling me if I wanted to keep my job, I was going to have to do better than that. Now, I don't know where she was, but she heard me drowning on the radio, and she let it happen. If you know you've got an employee who's drowning, stop it. If you see someone struggling to keep up, step in and see what you can do. We see this a lot with trainees, and there are various reasons why it happens. If it's the trainee's problem and they're just not cut out for the job, tell them. Don't let them continue to drown without stepping in. If it's a training issue with their trainer, get them a new trainer. Do what you can to remedy the situation, and if you can't, then cut ties. Be immovable. One advantage of working in a 24-7 operation is that schedules are flexible. Not many look at it that way because of the thinking that shifts are established and they may, must be covered the way they're set up. This is another um, example of thinking we've always done it that way. You want your employees to be engaged and you want them to grow so you can have a succession plan, but they can't do that if you're immovable. For instance, what if you have an employee who wants to take classes part-time while they're working? So they sign up for a class that's held on Tuesday and Thursday, but their days off are Monday and Tuesday. With 24-7 scheduling, you could give them Tuesdays and Thursdays off if you were willing to work with them. Just be willing to be flexible in your scheduling, whether it's for school or other unexpected events. Being hard and fast about things that are flexible um, about things that are flexible doesn't help you or your agency. Forget your employees' names. As ridiculous as this sounds, it happens. Most supervisors um, are in the communication center. They have an office in the communication center and they have regular interaction with their employees. But that isn't always the case. Like in larger centers, um, supervisors may actually have offices outside of the center where they have very little interaction with their employees unless they initiate it. The problem with that is they get so busy, they forget to come out of their office and interact with the employees. With the turnover rate being what it is, it's easy to have a large number of new employees in a very short amount of time. And if you don't maintain contact with your employees on a regular basis, you're soon going to have a room full of people you don't know. Um, one agency that I worked at, I had a chief who never visited communications. And one day he called the center, gave his last name to the call taker, and made his request. And she asked him who he was. She said, I'm sorry, sir, I don't know who you are. And he told her, you know, that he was her chief. Well, even though she had been there for about three months, she had never seen him because he never visited his employees. And then when he brought the complaint to me about her not knowing who he was, he called her by the wrong name. So I had to do some investigating to find out who he had spoken with. Don't let your situation get to this point. Maintain contact with your employees. Forget to recognize your employees. If you've ever listened in on one of my webinars, you know that I'm a huge proponent of employee recognition. After all, this is truly one of the most thankless jobs there is. We get no recognition for the things we get right, and we're excoriated for the things we do wrong. So it doesn't take a lot of effort or money to tell your employees they've done a good job. A simple thank you email or a handwritten note can raise the morale of an employee, and it also helps build that trust between them and you. I took a poll in my last webinar to see how many people hated to talk on the phone after having worked in communications for a while. 86% said they do not like talking on the phone. So these are the ones who are going to struggle here. As much as you may like to work by email, you still need, to fa you still need that face-to-face -face time with your employees. Now, email is good for documentation of instructions, policy changes, time off requests, etc. But communicating by email leaves a lot of room for interpretation since tone of voice and inflection are missing. Face-to-face -face time ensures your employees are understanding what you're saying um, and that they're on the right track. Close your office door. Closing your office door 
leaves the impression that you can't be bothered with their problem. Now, there's going to be times when you have to close your door for employee counseling sessions, investigations, things like that. But those times need to be few and far between. Now, I will admit I kept my door pulled to most of the time, but that was because I was freezing and I didn't want to let the heat from my heater escape. But I left it cracked enough that people could still lean in and talk to me. You want to have an open door policy, so you need to have an open door. Now, before we get to the questions, I want to let you know about our upcoming webinar next month. Same bat time, same bat channel. Recruiting and interviewing, picking the right people. As a leader, it's going to be up to you to try to hire the right people. But how do you know what you're looking for in a new employee? Do you want to hire someone with experience or without? Join us and we'll discuss various ways of testing and interviewing to get the right fit. Wednesday, September 2nd at noon Central Time. So now, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and send those in and I will answer any questions that you have. And if not, I want to thank you for joining us. This presentation has been made possible by Commercial Electronics, provider of public safety solutions, including Higher Ground Next Generation 911 Recording, Sequip Third Party Quality Assurance Program, and Carbine 911 Next Generation Call Handling Platform. Okay, so let's look. Um, the question is, what was the email we needed to contact for submitting this training? Um, it's right here, training at comelectronics.com. You are welcome. So I will leave this up in case there are any other questions. Um, if not, definitely tune in next month and um, for our next webinar. It would be the third in our leadership series. And otherwise, have a great day and a great rest of the week. Okay, we do have another question. When looking to promote, what are some things I can do to prepare? Um, like I said, uh, you need to uh, do some volunteering on some different committees, and you want to do what you can to take some of the classes that you will see in um, at APCO and NENA. Um, there are going to be a lot of places that, um, that will offer some free training and um, that you can uh, that you can use to prepare for. As a supervisor, you're going to have to have some extra FEMA classes that you don't necessarily have to have um, as a flying personnel. Um, you want to go ahead and start taking some management classes. Um, there are some uh, communication supervisor classes um, and manager classes through both APCO and NENA. And like I said, if, if your agency doesn't have the money, look to these two agencies for um, uh, scholarships. You might also check with some of your vendors, um, your CAD company, your, um, your 911 system company, different vendors that you have, and see if any of them would be willing to sponsor you to attend a management class. Um, there, I believe, um, NECMEC has a class for managers. There's, um, there are a lot of different management classes in 911. I think, I believe PSTC has a management class also. Um, but the ones that a lot of people are going to be looking for, a lot of agencies are going to be looking for your um, ENP certification. And um, ENP um, is through NENA, it's the Emergency Member Professional. You can uh, join a study group in your state and um, study for the test. Um, your agency, I mean, it's, you have to pay for the test. Your agency may be willing to do that to get you the certification so that it gives you a leg up when it comes time because it just shows that you have a lot of knowledge to be able to pass the test because it is 
a rigorous test. Um, there's the RPL certification through APCO. You've got the NENA Communication Center Management Program um, also. So check into all of those to determine, um, to figure out what classes you want to take. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.